All right, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Money Pillow podcast. Today I have with me my guest, Peter Shallard, who's a good friend of mine from New York City. Peter is probably the only psychologist um, that I like, know, and trust. And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, has built a business. Uh, I've had some, my parents got divorced when I was young. I had some issues with uh, psychologists, and then my mother in law is a psychologist, and you know how the whole mother in law thing goes. Anyway. Oh, man, you have a whole thing going on. We can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, I need your help, bro. <laughs> but Peter has a super successful business. Um, that we're going to talk about, and he's been a shrink for entrepreneurs, mainly focused with uh, high-level people who are doing big things for a long time, and I know uh, we haven't really ever talked about that side of it too much. We usually just chat and have a good time, but I'm sure, based on I know how successful you are, you must do an amazing job and help people kind of break through some barriers, Um, but one of the things I'm most excited to talk about is a new project that Peter has been working on called Commit Action, Um, and this is... This new thing he's been working on, it's Seth Godin. I don't know if you're familiar with Seth Godin. If you're listening, if you don't know Seth, go look him up. But Seth, um, if I'm not mistaken, didn't you tell me six months ago that he called you or had somebody reach out to you and say, hey, come into my office. I want to help you with this project. And then spent like three hours just basically help you map out this business. Is that right? Well, 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 let's be totally honest because uh, no, you know. let's lie. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was an hour. It was a, it was about an hour and a half, and um, yeah, it was through some crazy networking that I can. I honestly, I I, I don't know if I can take a hundred percent responsibility for it all, but um, it happened to be that a really good friend of mine chatted with uh, chatted with Seth, I guess, about what I was working on, and I got this email chain. That where they had been discussing me and where Seth just basically reached out like out of the blue, hit my inbox one day and he was like, hey, it would be great to talk. And I was like, I'm totally cool with that. And he's like, are you in New York? And I was like, yes. And he was like, okay, take the train and come and hang out at my office. Like, are you free next week? And it was funny because I wasn't actually in New York when this was taking place. This was like a Friday afternoon and he wanted me to come on Monday. And so I just immediately booked a flight from where I was in Colorado and went back home and was like, cut my this trip I was on short so I could get up there. This dude's like a hero to me. So I'm still yeah. so profoundly grateful that this actually, that yeah, that that actually happened. So, yeah, that, um, if you are not familiar with Seth, he's kind of a god in the marketing startup business world. Maybe not so much startup, but just business and marketing world and uh, I uh, I picked up permission marketing which is like I if not the oldest then definitely one of his oldest books in oh, it must have been like 2005 six maybe um, and that was a book that I read I picked it up in a secondhand bookstore in Sydney and um, yeah I it set me on the whole path to where I am now it helped me build the shrink for entrepreneurs as a brand online like that was that was the beginning for me like Seth has weirdly like just uncannily been instrumental and kind of has been there even without him knowing about it to begin with until recently he's been there at these pivotal moments in my career like the most single-handedly influential influential people in person in my life probably you know it's, it's crazy. interesting um, it's interesting you say that because I've read Purple Cow and I forget the other book uh, not permission marketing. I should probably pick that up. But to be honest, his his messaging didn't super resonate with me. Oh, um, really? So I, yeah, I don't have the same experience. But I have not given him a fair shake to say that uh, with confidence or whatever. But just my my short experience. Uh, a lot of it, it was just kind of for me, like yeah, I know that, I know that. But not that I know so much. But it just didn't seem that groundbreaking to me. But anyway, that's not the point of it. He's a huge, obviously, in the marketing world and business world. Uh, thought leader and this project excited him to the point he was willing to value uh, to give up his time to help you with it and it wasn't he didn't have any ulterior motive or agenda did he I think it was also the quality of the referral was was also what got him excited but the fact that it was about helping people be like he's really big on on people like his whole thing is like ship it like just commit to getting your project out the door like birth stuff into the world iterate create that's kind of his his like thing his deal. that he's into yeah, and- so when he found out that we were building this thing that's all about beating um, procrastination. I think that that was kind of exciting. That yeah, plus, see, let's you yeah. know, let's talk about it because we haven't really even said what it is yet. We're probably five minutes in. Um, and from what I understand, commit action is essentially uh, accountability coaching to kind of help you break through barriers and get more stuff done and reach goals faster. Uh, in a nutshell, and and for 
a flat fee every month. People pay, a, I'm not even gonna mention, I'll put a link on my website um, so you can go there, but it's such a low fee that you, yeah. can, you can sign up, you get a 15 minute call every week with a coach. Mm-hmm. And uh, is there an initial call that then is longer than 15 minutes or are they all? It's, it's also pretty short, yeah. So, okay. so this is, yeah, you're tapping into a few things there. Like one, we're trying to do accountability coaching. Like we set out to do the cheapest possible accountability coaching. So this is like super, super affordable. The reason that it's so short is that the idea is we're, we're trying to create these rituals in people's lives where they make commitments to themselves to achieve really big stuff and move their businesses, their plans, their dreams forward. So we keep it short because we want it to be sustainable. This is like a solution to a procrastination problem that doesn't take you hours to implement. You don't need to go to a weekend seminar. You can just plug it into your existing life and make it work. So. Yeah. The coaching is just part of it. We also have a bunch of technology that is part of what we do. We well, have you like, do. The, yeah, we have these very sexy like web um, web based dashboards that track and measure people's productivity over time. Because we kind of we, we have this whole body of knowledge based on like my years of working with different entrepreneurs that I've real I've spent years like figuring out how to crack the code on productivity and really defeat procrastination. Because I've struggled with it a, a shitload. Like if you want to do an interview on how much I've procrastinated. It's insane, man. It's like being a huge enemy of mine, and uh, that would my make clients two as of well. us. Yeah, it's a big deal. So, yeah, we we have the ingredients that uh, um, the ingredients, the things that we know. We call them like the pillars of productivity that beat procrastination, and we use human powered coaching, one to one, like totally direct with our accountability ninjas, and we also use technology to. Uh, to make that happen and we're working with the uh, assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School um, who's like a head neuroscience researcher. He's world renowned for the work that he does to basically use his neurological insight to drive like the stuff we do with our people, how we make them productive. Yeah, that's unbelievable to me. You just signed up that guy uh, on on your board of advisors and let's actually Mm. talk about it from a business perspective. Just touch on it and then we'll come back to it. Sure. Um, Ballpark, how many clients do you have right now that you're you're doing coaching for? Uh, we are we are rocking a couple of hundred right now. Nothing too crazy. Okay, couple hundred. And yeah. are your coaches employees or contractors? We work with contractors at the moment. We're uh, we're right in the middle of hustling. Like we're by we're we've been doing this for a year. So we're actually I was just having a meeting before we started this interview. Where I was talking with one of my with our, one of our key managers and chatting about like what's it going to take to bring people on like full time employees. What does that involve? You know, we don't got know it. this stuff. Okay. We just make it up as we go along. So yeah, no, yeah. I, no, I love it. So you've got a couple hundred people that are paying you. Um, Right now, they're independent contractors. They're location independent. It's the coolest job in the world because we're empowering like these super young, like super driven, amazing people who are really into like productivity. They're super disciplined. We selectively hire using a lot of psychological profiling to find the best possible accountability ninjas, and then we basically empower them to live a location independent lifestyle and uh, work with work coaching all these really interesting entrepreneurs to kick ass and beat pro- uh, beat procrastination. Dude, I love it's it. A cool so job. I can pay you a, it's a hundred, two, three, four hundred bucks a month, some nominal fee, and yeah. I get a coach and I get access to a system that includes software. Uh, that helps hold me accountable, and this all of this comes from years of research you've done on the topic of procrastination and how to beat it, and you've bundled all of this. You've created this whole business. The coolest thing I think about this, okay, so this, you know, we uh, there's so many different ways to skin the cat, and this model for you is hands off for the most part now that you've built it outside of biz development. Is that correct? Yeah. So. Right now, I mean, let's just I, wait. Hold on, hold on. Let's just back up. You yeah. have a couple hundred clients. Let's say you were like, "All right, I'm done. I'm not bringing on any any new clients." How much work is involved for you to manage the 200 clients, the coaches, and everything you have? Like, literally, you know, on a weekly basis, could you, if you just shut that down now and just let the existing book of business ride out, is that a is that a 40 hour a week job, a 30 hour a week job, 20 hour a week job, two hour a week job? I'm like trying to be super idealistic about it. Like if I just did zero hours a week, I, re- I think we'd probably still be in business in like another six months, maybe even 12, like potentially. Because we're at the moment, like our marketing is working well enough that we're slowly growing. 
um, we we wouldn't. We also do a lot of wholesale partnerships. Like we work with. Have you interviewed anyone from the foundation? No, I have not. That's coming up soon. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, when that happens, yeah, we're actually working with Andy and Dane, so we're going to be providing accountability coaching services for the duration of the foundation for their people. So, so when people you know what, sign you know what, up, you know what? I think. Hold on. Let's rewind this. I get it. <laughs> I get it. And I think we're like we're getting we're getting far ahead, and we're missing out on a lot of the exciting stuff. Okay. Uh, how you had this business for how long? But and actually, before I get there, my whole point was you've set up a system where the clients come in, however they come in, they pay. Mm-hmm. You're not looking at that lead and go, okay, I'm going to give this to Jerry in Utah to be the no. coach. That's no. that's systematized in some fashion or another, right? Yeah, it's human powered. This is not like an all digital business because no. it is like that's what we're doing is we're kind of bridging like humans and technology. So we have a team who do all of that kind of okay, stuff. Okay, so you, you've put people in place. Totally. And you literally I could probably... Team. I do payroll, so that's why the business would fall apart. Every month I go make sure everybody gets paid, so... Which is something uh, you can outsource, you know that, right? Totally, yeah. Yeah, and that's probably a good thing to get. But th- my point was, you could walk away right now, probably uh, maintain the current book of business you have based on the marketing you've done, or mm-hmm. just slowly slip a little, but... Uh, and you would earn a great revenue with probably a few hours work a week at best. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just did that. I just did that for the summer. It was kind of kind of slacked off a little bit, and for the last three months, and uh, yeah, we're still here. We're still so all summer. Out. How many hours do you think you put into it? Like on, on commit a, action on a weekly basis, maybe like the two or three. And is it fair to say you earn more than ten grand a month from that business? We're, we're doing pretty well, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, so let's back we're, up. So we're, yeah, we were coasting over the summer. I sound like, you're making me sound like a slacker because I like, I believe. No, like no, 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 it's not because I, I, dude, I get it. I get it yeah. prior to me. Um, trust me, we've had people on these podcasts who work four hours a month and, you know, Melanie and Devin Duncan. Mm-hmm. Uh, Devin told me he works on custom Greek rights five hours a month and the business does multiple millions in revenue. Um, and it's not about being a slacker. He just chooses to, he built that business. I mean, it's what the money pill is all about. He built a bit, the business, set up a bunch of systems. Now he's using that time and energy to focus on another business that he's passionate about and also yeah. enjoying life. So it's not about being a slacker. Nobody's going to think you're a slacker. It's Yeah, it, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But yeah. here's what I've done. I've tried to set this up, this thing up to be as automated as possible so that I can focus full time on growth. On growth, yes. On business development. That's what it's all about to Because me. that is your strength, right? Yeah, I'm not like super into, I don't want to go lay on a beach for like the next year. Like I, I live in New York City, I live in downtown Manhattan, I like to get shit done. Um, yeah, well you don't have the beach wrapped all around you all the time. Imagine being in Santa Barbara, dude, it's it's pretty damn tempting. <laughs> I know, yeah, it does sound good. I do like to get out to the mountains and go skiing. So like I do I do totally do work-life balance, but right now we're in hustle mode, we're growing, we're, we're onboarding customers like crazy, we're making partnerships happen, we do a lot of B2B stuff. It's Okay, yeah. so let's back up because now we're getting kind of big picture growth stuff. Um, how long ago did you start this business? A year ago, actually, well, just slightly over. We started in June. We we launched the the sort of beta version to the, of this product out to the people who follow me and my kind of online brand at the Shrink for Entrepreneurs in June last year. So we're pretty we're pretty young, pretty new. Okay. And with that said, how long how long ago did you get the idea to do this? Oh, dude, a long time ago. I've been meditating on like the best version of this, like dreaming about this business in some form or another, probably for like five years. Okay. At what point did you decide to get serious? Was it January, February, March, April, May of last year? Uh, That's a really good question. Ballpark. I I would probably say I will do, I'm going to draw a line in the sand and say when I threw down money, like because I, I invested, obviously, sure. we built technology. That happened in, I think, January 2012. So January 2012. So you, you worked on the program, got everything built up, launched it in June. Yeah. And yeah. The, the, the great thing about this business is since you really don't have a ton of employees, your only real expenses uh, are realized outside of the investment into getting it up and running building out the software, building the website, the system, your only real expenses are uh, based on action or somebody actually paying you money and then you have an expense to the coach for that. Is that correct? Is that fair? Totally, yeah. Okay. So we designed it, yeah. It's it's basically like how we have like flat costs of like the cogs, the cost of goods and services. They, they, they scale as we bring on customers and it's been profitable from June. Like we we posted a profit at the end of that, of June last year. So your first month you were in the green. 
Mm-hmm. Did you yeah, recover? We have, did, were you able to recover your investment at that point, or just on yeah, not including the investment? We paid back like what I invested into it three months in. Three months so, in, so three months yeah. in, you're at break even, and then the future is all profit. Okay, and how many? Uh, how many? You said now you have somewhere around a couple hundred. How was that first month in that beta launch? Was it ten people, twenty people? No, we did quite a few. Like I've got a pretty decent following online, so it was like a very soft launch to, I guess, what you would call the warmest leads ever. Like people who have been reading my blog over at petershallard.com for years, some of them, and like I've only ever sold ultra high ticket price consulting services. So when I threw down like the cheapest accountability coaching kick-ass thing that you've ever heard of, like there was naturally like these people were kind of hungry for that. So I love it, and actually just. Take, give me 30 seconds or, or a minute or two. Do you have any amazing stories of breakthroughs um, from some of your clients that have gone through it? That yeah. you can talk about without revealing somebody's Totally, no, we do, we do, we do, yeah. We, um, we had this one woman, uh, Jody, I think her name was, who was a blogger, I'm, I'm pretty sure, don't quote me on the name, but she, uh, she did the program and was building a business, I guess, creating, doing some content marketing stuff. I don't know exactly what her business is. I don't know all these people intimately, but she was doing a lot of writing. Like she was cr- producing a lot of content or trying to. And we got this email that she sent to her coach that we asked her, we were like, can we use this as a testimonial? Because after doing the program, I think for a month, like the first month that she signed up, she was like, I have been trying to write like a handful of words and have just been staring at a blank page for the last like six months. And in the month that I've spent with this commit action coach beating this procrastination beast, I've written 8,000 words. And I think she was three weeks into her month. Holy cow. That. Yeah. And, and so like that's that- crazy. I mean, some people write a lot more content than that. But if you're talking about going from like, staring at a blank page for six months, doing 200 words, deleting them all. So it's a like major breakthrough. Yeah. Any other like huge wins that are notable you can think of? Oh, off the top I mean, of because while you're thinking of that, the thing I think is cool about this is you have built a business that is fairly hands-off outside of the biz dev and the growth aspect of it, but it's changing people's lives and it's actually doing something cool and it's not, um, it's not widgets, it's not this. So I don't know, for me that's like, it's almost unbelievable. It's not unbelievable, but it's cool. I mean, I always feel like those that provide the most value get rewarded the most. And um, and I think with what you're doing, it's just really cool. So if you can think of another story, great. Tell me. If not, no big deal. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, like, remember our, our – I'm. I like have got a team who co- who organize and collect testimonials from our customers. So we right. have a process for that. But the shitty thing is that it means that they're not at the front of my mind. I'm like yeah, scanning. You're not hand involved in it. Find stuff. Yeah, I was waiting for the. Uh, you know, in three weeks of working with a coach, the guy went from a million in sales to three men in sales. And no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but as you go, I'm sure there's going to be more and more crazy stories that come out. And we had a um, we had a financial planner actually who got started with us really early on, um, and that's like a very like I think when you do stuff online, you get a lot of people like that other story I told you. It's a it's a classic, um, you know, like content creator. Someone's trying to do blogging or whatever. But this guy was like a super traditional. Like he was selling investment products, financial instruments to you know wealthy people and trying to hustle and make his way as like a you know like a one man one man entrepreneur doing all of that kind of stuff. And um, he signed up for it and and had just incredible feedback. Like he was just he just said that the the actual comment that I did find while I was um, putting there, he emailed us and would, and basically said for people who are wondering if you need a, a professional accountability coach, you need one. And like he was all about measurement and just like the numbers of this works. Like he looked at it as an invest investment. This is the quote: "You need to actually be invested, and I mean financially invested in your accountability. That's real accountability." If you're wondering if you need a professional about accountability coach, you need one. So this dude, uh, I don't think he wanted to tell us the numbers he was doing, but like, he yeah, he was killing it. Broke through next level. Yeah, I get it. I love it, man. I love it. So it's and it's cool. It's just such an interesting business model. Um, you know, one that I really can't think of anybody else who has something similar. But I get it. You have coaches that you have somebody in place that when a new sale comes through, they're assigned to a coach. The coach knows what they're supposed to do. They handle it. There's probably mm-hmm. no customer support. The coaches are probably the customer support. Well, that's the thing. It's like really easy to, to manage your customer support when you have someone who's on your team who's talking to your customer every single week. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I mean, I imagine like from a moving pieces 
standpoint, I imagine you, how does the team look? Do you have a manager that manages all the coaches or a couple managers or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. so we totally have coach like team leaders who are people, those are the first people that we're going to bring on as employees, but we kind of hire, like where we sort of define ourselves as like a scrappy startup. So we're hiring people who are a little entrepreneurial. So when I first said to them, like crazy job idea, we're going to pay you, you know, like you're going to be a contractor, you handle your own life, you know, like make all of your own big, big boy decisions. These people were totally up for that. But now as we've grown, and like definitely the next step for us is kind of formalizing all that stuff and locking these people in, in as the positions, uh, yeah. yeah. And that, that kind of creates your systems uh, right. so that you can focus on what you're good at, which is aside from coming up with a phenomenal idea is the biz dev, biz dev side of it. And yeah. uh, there's no doubt in my mind you're going to be uber successful. In fact, we can talk about that. So did you have any, um, so right now, you, again, you said you had somewhere around a couple hundred clients mm -hmm. and you start, you never told me, how many did you start out with that first month when you did your soft launch? Was it 50, 100? It was it was like somewhere just shy of fifty. I'm pretty sure. Fifty, yeah. okay. And um, and was it just a slow growth between now and then to two hundred? What we discovered is that it was way easier for us to go B two B and grow the business that way in big chunks rather than B two C. Right, so, because you can work with somebody like me who has a large audience that I could either promote your offer mm. to and earn a small commission or we can do what we call like white labeling where I take your services and I say, you know what, Peter, I've got this other program that I offer that mm. if I could have a coach um, that anybody who buys it have a coach that actually spends a month or two months or three months or ongoing, uh, you know, sit with this person on a weekly basis, make sure they're going through the program, getting it done. You can adopt your program a little bit to hold people accountable um, you can adopt your, the way you do your normal coaching to hold people accountable to get my program done. Is that kind of the idea? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's what we do with, with, uh, with our partnerships. Yeah. Like the, like the foundation guys, that's, uh, they're one of our, one of our favorite partners. Cause I love those dudes. They're like really good friends of mine. And, uh, yeah, like that's, that's kind of what we discovered is that like the white labeling wholesale partnerships, affiliate type deals, those were a lot easier for me to go and pursue it's kind of like a question of like oh you can add on like a couple of hundred customers at a time or you can go and figure out the whole online marketing piece that people like you are experts at where you bring on one at a time yeah, and the thing no, I is, is I, I, get it, I thought I was awesome at online marketing and you know I know a lot about online marketing but I spent the last six years building a business that sells like ultra premium priced consulting which is my, my sort of day job as a shrink for entrepreneurs so I've never launched like a major info product or done anything like that but I do have a background in B2B business development like at the enterprise level so I, I've totally played that game before so I'm just, I was just, just lean right into my strengths and yeah, yeah, went off with the partnership it. deals, yeah. Yeah, and so you started doing some partnership deals and that was kind of a, a big aha moment to get the growth going. And yeah. And we talked the other day, um, oh, I'm just trying to think, so there wasn't like any, that was your big light bulb moment. It wasn't like, oh, I started using Google AdWords and that crushed it or started advertising on the Get Stuff Done blog and that crushed it or... or it was a big light bulb moment. When we built this, we never, I never imagined that I never envisaged the B2B partnership Got thing, it. the white labeling thing, until it was actually built. And then I was like, wait a second, because uh, let me get a little psychological with you for a second. We designed like the coaching, the methodology that our coaches use, the four pillars of productivity that the whole system, our software, everything is built on. It's all what we call in, in psychotherapy content free. It's clean. And what that means is that it's ultimately like a mirror. For the, from the point of view of the customer, it holds up a mirror to them and forces them to look at what's preventing them from moving forward, what's going on internally. It forces you to see yourself, be more committed to yourself. But the thing is, is that because it's content free, our coaches are accountability experts only. They're not going to tell you how to grow your accounting business, your law firm, yeah, your it's blog. not their role. It's not their yeah, role. Yeah, they're just good at psychology, the psychology of of productivity. That's yeah. all they do. I and so, it. like. I created that because I wanted to create this kind of pure specialist thing. Like that was my value and it's still important to me. But by accident, once we built it and I had these guys who are these accountability ninjas, I was like, oh wow, you can now pair this with anything. Like you want to do a diet program? Get an accountability ninja. You want to do like a, you want to learn how to make money online and actually implement stuff? You probably need an accountability ninja. Like Dude, commit action just pairs with, it pairs it's with everything. It's so powerful, man. I, um, 
I quit smoking one time and I decided to call that. I was just driving down. I wanted to quit. I couldn't quit. It was so hard. And I decided to call, pick up the phone and call that 1-800-QUIT-NOW. And I don't know if you've ever heard the advertising. That was part of the big tobacco as a, deal. as a foreigner, you forgot to introduce me as a foreigner, by the way. You said I, I'm from New York. I'm oh my totally God, from, that's right. I'm totally from New Zealand, everyone. Sean is full of shit. Um, but I, <laughs> but I, live in, I live in New York. But as a foreigner, your cultural references from like more than two years ago, I totally missed. Yeah, was, so we, uh, all, the, all the states did a class action lawsuit against the big com- tobacco companies and won a lot of money that they used to create these programs um, nas- nationwide called 1-800-QUIT-NOW. And you can pick up the phone and call 1-800-QUIT-NOW. When you call, somebody answers and say, okay, you want to quit smoking? And they transfer you to your coach. You get This person picks up the phone. She's like, hi, I'm Sarah. Awesome. So why ah, do you want to quit? That and is awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. So she spends 10 It's all free. Wow, the more you know. I had no idea this was a thing. That's yeah, so spends cool. 10 minutes talking to you. And, and um, this was somebody It was probably a lot like the coaches you have. She was not like a telemarketer by any means. She was like what I, what I would envision talking to a psychologist over the phone. And she gave me some insight as to why it's going to be a challenge to quit, why I do smoke, why I can't just stop quitting. Told mm-hmm. me some things that I'd never heard before. And I'm, I'm like, wow. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but nicotine actually releases. What is that uh, chemical that? Uh, all the drugs are releasing into your brain now, like dopamine. The, not dopamine, but um, the one that makes you happy. Uh, oxytocin. Not that one. I Ser- ecstasy. People that do ecstasy, it's like the one thing. Serotonin, right? Serotonin. serotonin. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And yeah. Uh, it releases when you smoke. It releases serotonin. The nicotine mm-hmm. does. Sends a trigger, release serotonin. So that's why people who smoke get grumpy when they don't have smokes for a long time. They have a smoke. They're all happy. And, totally. And, it's, uh, a, it's a state state change technique. That's why it's so addictive. Exactly. Well, that and the breathing and the slowing down. So what she told me was that you know, the nicotine sends a trigger to the brain to release it. And uh, if you don't, if you stop smoking, go cold turkey, don't use the patch, don't eat, don't eat gum, whatever, your body does not, has gotten so used to having this drip fed thing telling it to you know, send, send serotonin, send serotonin that... It depletes it a little, or not depletes it, but it forgets how to naturally release serotonin in your body. So that's why people right. are so grumpy when they try and quit. And so for the first time in my life, I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm not that tough. I don't have to be that tough. I should probably take the patch. Right. And, uh, and then it'll help with that. And, uh, and then she's like, all right, I'm going to call you next week. This week, I want you just to do this, this, and this. I'll call you next week. And then every call I have with her, which was probably two or three before I'd, it had worked and it was successful, I was like, I cannot let this down. I cannot let that's her awesome. down. Yeah. Accountability, man. Yeah. yeah. It's, it was a, it was a main factor and like probably anyway. So I, I totally get it. I've had experience with it before. I've never had it from a, uh, until recently hired a business coach. that has been helping me a lot, but, um, never had it prior to that. And I, I just know it works. And when, when I talk to you and I tell you, yes, Peter, I'm going to do this by next week. And I like you and I respect you and I don't want to let you down. I'm going to get it done. And Here, yeah, here's the thing. Here's why I created this. Like this is the, the, the kind of passion piece. The, the the world has like changed really massively in the last 50 years like the definition 50, of like, like five years yeah right like the, the it's just accelerating the labor the type of work that we do has massively changed like our great grandparents were probably farmers you know and like they they like grew stuff in the <laughs> they ground. were not on skype in their in their home offices right conducting like, interviews whatever great great grandparents you don't have to go that many generations back to have people who like couldn't procrastinate they could never procrastinate on anything because if they did like they would miss the harvest and then they would have no food and no money you know and they'd be totally screwed so like nature was your accountability coach and it would punish you you know like a motherfucker like it was it was a big it was a big deal and then the industrial revolution happened and these crazy business tycoons built these awesome factories that rocked for them and sucked for everybody else where they put people in these these jobs that were like robots so you had like a conveyor belt bringing your work to you and if you missed quota, like you would be fired and there'd be like dozens of people waiting to take your job. You know what I mean? Sure. So again, yeah. procrastination, not a problem for the majority of people. You just did what you had to do. But now like there's this crazy thing going on. The internet's happened. The knowledge economy is here. We all do these weird esoteric things. And I'm not even just talking about entrepreneurs, even employees at, at real companies now working from home have like flat like organizational structures and are defining their own work. Like almost everybody listening to this podcast is basically paid to think up and execute really cool ideas. You know? Yeah. Like it doesn't I matter agree. really where they are. And certainly as an entrepreneur, like I'm a solopreneur. This is my office. I'm in an apartment in the West Village of Manhattan. And the fact that I can build a business here, 
like a really successful business to shrink for entrepreneurs without having a business partner, without really having any staff. Like I have an assistant for that that side of the business. It's crazy. Like where's the accountability? Where's the deadlines? Where's any of the things that create productivity? So yeah, no, I get it. Procrastination yeah. is an epidemic, Sean. It's getting it's crazy. Like it's crazy how many people are affected by this problem that did not exist 50 years ago. And we're totally inequipped to deal with it because we actually pursue all of these things. Like how many people do you know who are like, I don't want to have a boss. I'm sick of all of the bullshit deadlines. I want to get away. I want to be able to work whenever I want, which means I don't have to ever work. So they get rid of all of the things that actually make them productive. And then they're like, oh, I wonder why I'm not successful. Because that's how procrastination flourishes. Like that's what we're doing with commit action. Our mission is like we're fighting a war against procrastination. Dude, I love it. And you know, I never thought about it from all those different perspectives, uh, from historical and then how times are different now. And it's really interesting to think about, you know, my mother, uh, faced some of the same challenges. She was an entrepreneur, but she was a rare breed in her day, you know, in her working life. And, um, my father was kind of a, you know, get up, go to work kind of guy. He was an airline pilot. My grandparents definitely, uh, I guess my grandfather was a salesman, a traveling salesman for a lumber company. So he potentially could have dealt with some things, but in general, it's just, you know, if I look at the business and the company I have and, and my sisters and all my friends, yeah, it's, I can totally see it. I can totally see it. And oftentimes what drives me is the ability to continue earning revenue to put food on my table and enjoy my lifestyle. But then oftentimes I've gotten to a point where my business is completely systematized and you know, where's the motivation at that point? Because the money's going to come in and yeah. yeah. You know, so for me it's more, um, I don't know. I can totally see the value in it and I can see why it is such an epidemic because yeah, it's, it's a different world than we've ever lived in and interesting. So, okay. So let's, let's move along now. So you've had this business now for about a year and right now you're working fairly hard on it because you're, you're in the biz dev phase. You have a couple hundred customers now. I mean, I know you've got some lofty goals. Um, you shared with me a little bit yesterday and we, we chatted, but where do you see, you're doing a lot of B2B stuff now. Mm-hmm. And do you see, I mean, obviously you determine this business is scalable. You've figured out ways to bring on hundreds of coaches should you need them mm-hmm. um, in a fairly swift fashion. And if I'm not mistaken, you have some pretty big corporate, um, corporate or B2B projects that you're working on that involve uh, commit to action or commit action that um, we'll bring in thousands of clients. Is that right? Roughly? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we do right now. Okay. And now is this something, my question for you is with this, is this, um, so in a year from now, it's fair to say that your business will be 10 times the size it is now. That's what we are currently preparing for. Yeah. That's basically (laughs) like what's, what's up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's incredible. Um, to think about it from that perspective and you figured out how to scale that and how to grow that and you've got systems in place to hire enough people. And I know there's a lot of coaches out there um, that do coach the, for all different kinds of things. So, Yeah, the thing is is that we don't actually employ them. We're not interested in hiring people who are trying to... Coach um, already. Yeah, who are trying to like build coaching businesses themselves. I, I'm, I'll get a little bit self-righteous if we talk about why. I'm not sure how important that is. But we have like a very different kind of methodology for how we hire and train people to, to work for us and what makes a really good accountability coach. So what is, I mean, what, how does that look? We, I think <laughs> you're, yes. asking, you're asking me about a ton of the things that uh, our competitive differences and our like insulation from, uh, you know, from the commoditization of such services. Stuff so you don't these, want to talk about. these are the things that these are we proprietary do. Really, really things, different. right? Yeah, but we have some really like our coaches are intensively trained. They do. We, we scoop up people who we kind of psychologically assess to be a really fantastic fit. We're trying to build a company culture of people who are really into help like our our coaches are soldiers enlisted in the war on procrastination they're people who want to live a fantastic lifestyle but they also want to be like they also have a massive value for helping people bust through the stuff that's really important to us we're finding that uh yeah they generally enjoy it yeah that's it's a passion of theirs they come from all different places and and part of the big problem with Part of the problem with coaches who are already up and running is I've, I know a huge number of people in that space. Like I'm super well networked in the kind of coaching community, that whole world. And um, those folks tend to be 
oh, I don't know what I'm going to say here. They tend to be much more interested in building, like they don't want to work as, they don't want to be a part of a company. They're not looking for a job. They're trying to build some massive business for themselves where they can, like the, that industry is all about pushing people to charge, to just like charge more and more and more and more, more, more money. You know, to ultimately like get yeah. to the point where you're Tony Robbins. And we live in a world now where there's, and like I'll say all of this while being part of it to be, you know, full disclosure. But we live in a world now where there's people who have like zero real business experience, zero real psychological background, like in terms of any academic sense or well, not that that stuff necessarily matters, but like they don't have one or the other. And they're charging top dollar for like, these coaching services, we're talking about thousands of dollars an hour in some cases. And so when you're talking to people, even if you're, even if a coach isn't at that point yet, those are their role models, the people who are at that level. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's a, I think it's a clusterfuck to be honest. Like I'm not sure who's winning out of this industry. Like certainly the customers aren't always, I don't know, dude, we can, I will, we can I will go on and on about, about that. Yeah. But I'm, I'm well aware of it too. I know a lot of people that do the high end stuff. Um, and this is all saying like full disclosure, as a shrink for entrepreneurs, I sell ultra high priced one on one consulting services. So and wouldn't you I, be calling the, the, the oh, kettle totally. black? I'm yeah. just way better than everybody else, dude. <laughs> but you but there is a difference because you have formal training and you also have business experience and um, yeah, but at the end of the day it's funny. I wonder if people get results mainly because they put money down and they're now committed because they've pulled money out of their pocket. Or if that's from a psychological standpoint, that's really an afterthought and I don't know. Anyway, we can go on and on, but let's, let's focus back on the business. So right. commit to action, commit to action. Why do I keep calling commit to action? Commit we, action. Yeah, we totally turned a verb into a noun, so it confuses the brain. But, uh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you, um, you get some pretty lofty goals and have some pretty good things lined up where you're working with. We do. Um, high level kind of B2B customer acquisition. How does that yeah. look out of curiosity? Um, you know, what do you do to insulate uh, you know, for that growth, if you bring on hypothetically one client brings a thousand clients, uh, one, one B2B client brings a thousand new clients to your business. Um, is that a three month gig, a six month gig, a nine month gig? Um, you know, how do you deal with that ramp up where there potentially could be a huge fall down? Yeah, that's a good problem. Um, it's a nice problem to have. The way that we have dealt with it is that our coaches are obviously contractors. So like they are, you know, they're self-employed kind of working with us. So we don't have to, like so far we've been, that, and that's actually what's happened when you're asking me like how many people do you have now? We actually had a lot more clients in the past. We've had a, we've had a summer of pain. We've been reworking our systems. Our client numbers have been an all-time low. We're still profitable, but just not nearly as much as we used to be. So we're currently experiencing that problem that you're talking about. And yeah, we're dealing with it. We're making a few of our coaches unhappy, but because right. they yeah, that's work. What I was wondering, do you lose those coaches in the process? We haven't lost any yet. I've been uh, I've been doing some leadership and keeping them going. Um, but and, and we really, if they're if they have their own if it's their own gig anyway, why would they even leave? It's just a matter how how much money it is. It's extra money for them, right? Right. Well, that's the thing. It's like most of them are doing something like for oh for starters, I should mention that it's only ever a part time gig because these calls are like fifteen minutes long a week. Can you imagine doing that for forty hours? We don't, no way. We, don't yeah. we don't allow them to do it. We'll do like a maximum of about 25 per coach. And that's for our guys who are like as keen as mustard and they're really into it. So, yeah. Did you yeah say so as it keen is, as mustard. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a super granddad expression, but uh, it fits. Um, it's a New Zealand yeah. one too. Where, um, really? <laughs> I haven't ever heard it. Really? Yeah. That's funny. Um, what, was, what were we talking about? Um, so, we were talking about scaling and then, like, you know, how do you protect yourself? Uh, well, here's the thing. Here's what we've learned. This is this is a badass interview, by the way, because I'm I am now talking about literally where I like what I was working on this afternoon. Like this is awesome. no bullshit. We're we're a badass company. Our service is polished and awesome, but this is where we're totally messy and fucked up. Um, what, what I love the transparency, out, by the way. It's just just tell appreciate me what it. it is, man. No worries. What we've figured out is that this is why B two B sucks. This is where I've been spanked and schooled in the last years. We've had massive success, huge highs, massive lows, and obviously the problem is our staff are like they can't deal with that. No one loves to make tons of money one month and hardly any money the next month. You right, know? because that would happen if let's just say yeah. Xerox brings you a thousand employees and then it's a three month gig and they're gone. Yeah, I get it exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So. 
we what we figured out is that this company the only way this company can succeed and be sustainable long term is to sustainably grow through both b2b and b2c yes so once this happened we realized oh shit we actually need to market direct to consumers because that way like when we onboard a client like this week we signed up a bunch of clients through our b2c marketing that we've been implementing this is what we've been working on over the summer you know right and yeah, when that happens, like every single one of those persons is the per- people is their own unit. So customer retention wise, we are phenomenal at customer retention. By the way, how does like that when look? Can I ask? When we, yeah, so we. Um, What's the life when, cycle of your average person who signs up? Is it three I'll tell months? You this this four is months? the stat that I'm most proud of. When we launched Commit Action in June last year, the bare like the the beta version, the first version of this thing, four months in, we had ninety two percent customer retention. That's incredible. Yeah. For the price point you have, and and the coolest thing is too, you really don't have. Well, whatever the business you have, does like the content, the software, um, the coaching, like it's just it's it's timeless, really. I mean, you could probably the software may need to change as consumer behavior and the web changes, but probably not too much if it's if it's clean and good looking. Uh, but you know, one of the struggles I face selling trainings is constantly, if I have a training on how to, uh, you know, use your Facebook fan page for marketing, I have to update that three times a year because the fan pages are always changing. So you've got this model that, um, Facebook are annoying like that, right? Yeah. Well, they all, every (laughs) website is because you know, consumer behavior changes and and what they want to see and how they interact with the website is constantly evolving. Mm. And in in my opinion for the better. So Mm. I think things get cleaner and better looking all the time. I mean, you go back to websites from 2001, 2002, and it's, it's just atrocious to look at. But anyway, so my point, though, is I think you've got a great business in the sense that it's, um, you know, all your work really is spent on biz dev stuff if you want to do it. If not, you have incredible retention. You've got a product that's, for the most part, timeless. Uh, the way it's set up, it's fully systematized, so you don't have to go hey, John in Utah, we just got a new client. You want to be his coach? You know, I'm going to email his info, then you contact, you you systematized all of it. Was it set up that way from the beginning? Yeah, I mean, dude, like I've kind of, yeah, been around the block a few times. Like I, you know, I realized right at the start that like that phone call that you just role played is like, there is no reason for me to be doing that ever. (laughs) No. You know what I mean? So I, I kind of knew that. So I just immediately put somebody on that when I started and you know, we've gone through like all of the normal company stuff. We had like the the guy who was like the oiler, the dude who put the oil on all the cogs of this business, got offered an incredible job somewhere else and got poached. And I'm happy for him. He's awesome, Joe. He knows that I love him. And um, yeah, he went and did that. And I was like, holy shit, what are we gonna do? Because he knew commit action inside and out almost better than I did. And he was kind of running the show behind the scenes. Dude, one time I emailed him and I was like, Joe, what's the uh, what's the admin password for the, the, like commitaction.com, like our back end? Right. Like, uh, you know, like. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I'm the same way in my business. Yeah. It's, I don't know the passwords to my merchant accounts to go see how much revenue we did from a sales thing. I just don't even know it. Yeah, yeah and I it's not it. that I'm not committed to our customers, but I've realized that like what I the, the impact I can make in their experience does not come from like knowing how to log into the back end of our system. You no, know what no, I mean? The impact came from what you created. Now it's your duty to go out and find and expose this to empower and help more people. I get it. Yeah. yeah I love it. So yeah. all right. But just so, yeah, to circle back the like what we're talking about about the sort of messy bleeding edge of where we're up to is yeah, we kind of realized B2C is something that we have to do to kind of insulate ourselves from the 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 seasonal nature of B2B business development, the ultra long sales cycle. Like we have deals maturing now that I started working on over a year ago. That are B2B. You know? Yeah, yeah. Not over a year ago, like I guess like a year ago. Yeah. Yeah, it's so funny. Um this morning I was out surfing and I had a real similar conversation with a friend of mine. He has a product and company called Wallet Tracker, and it's a Bluetooth device. You can It's about the size of a quarter. You can slip into your wallet, and with an iPhone mm-hmm. app, uh, it tracks your wallet. So if, if I were to go to eat at a restaurant, left my wallet on the dinner table, and I left, I'd get a push notification saying, this is the last known location of your wallet. You've, you've separated yourself from your wallet or your car keys. It's got a bunch of different uses they use it for. And they, they got really focused on B2B stuff about a year ago, and they landed deals with Verizon, uh, Samsonite, and these other companies. Um, but what they found was if the, the B2B was, was somebody who was going to be selling it, oftentimes they didn't know how to sell it. Mm. So 
or how to do the marketing behind it to sell it. Like for example, Verizon, I think put these little devices in 1800 stores, but they just don't display them properly. The, the people in the don't know. So they've been doing all this education, it's all this work. They're not even sure if they're getting another order from Verizon or Samsonite. So he said to me, he's like, you know, we, yeah. we recently kind of came to the realization that although B2B has these giant, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, carrots dangling in front of you, this big jackpot, if you land it, uh, it can also be detrimental in the sense that if you don't figure out the B2C marketing, that may go away at any point. So you have this big win and there's a big loss. Whereas the B2C generally, when you figure out that marketing is a much more gradual uh, climb yeah. up. You know, but the, the thing about like what I've learned in my kind of years of working with all kinds of different entrepreneurs and stuff is that B2B businesses that like where that's just what they do, like, you know, say like a consulting company, they only become what I would call like safely sustainable. Like that company isn't going anywhere. They're going to keep doing business, supporting all their employees, paying profits to their shareholders, you know, at like massive scale. So it's Huge much scale. easier. I get it. It's much easier to be like a smaller. Uh, it's much easier to be like a coach who works one on one with your consumer. If you want to be a consultant who works with like a huge number of Fortune 500 companies, at some point you're going to figure out that if you're not McKinsey, you know, you're not actually going to succeed because you need to have a team of a hundred business development guys, like sales dudes, who are going out and prospecting for you, so that their funnels are always full. So that like the same thing I'm talking about that we're doing with Commit Action where like one dude is signing up every day and like one dude is quitting every like month or you know like it's so it's just this constant flow that keeps the Is it mainly moving. guys? Uh, no, I was totally being sexist just then. It's not. We're no, I'm just 50, curious. You just it's that. about 50-50 actually. Is it really? Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, honest, right for some reason man. I would feel like it would appeal more to men but I don't know. Anyway, so that's interesting you said that and I was just curious. So, but but yeah, but your 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 buddy is totally right. Like, if you're going to do solely B two B, like you just have to be such a so much of a bigger organization. And I've seen so many companies fail, like trying to get there somewhere in the middle. You know what I mean? I completely get it. And and I'll bring like, up you, a, you you could have five full time salespeople, and they could go three months with none of them closing anything. Like that could totally happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. So on the B I, on the B two C stuff, are you doing like paid traffic, search traffic, Facebook ads, or? No, we are not. We're not awesome at that kind of stuff. What we're what we're doing right now is um, we've been creating this badass content funnel, and I've been funneling traffic to it more organically from all over the place. Um, oh, nice. we're, we're just getting started, though, dude. So this is like just happening, but it's totally working. We have. Um, I got. I sat down with the uh, with our advisory board member, um, Dr. Srini Pillai. Uh, he's uh, this Harvard dude. He's the uh, this neuroscience, like world-renowned neuroscience researcher, and um, he's also super entrepreneurial. He's an invited faculty member at Harvard Business School, and um, he and I worked on basically this badass content that's about the four pillars of productivity, like the the four kind of psychological ingredients that actually destroy procrastination. And the way that the content worked is that we made the decision to kind of expose people to these ideas and just be like, this is what our product is made of and our product is the best way to get this. But if you go like jump on that email list and get that content, you can go away and implement that on your own theoretically. But it's like hard to do, you know, like people read the emails and are like, yeah, this is awesome and it's kind of stuff that I knew before but now I know how important it is but there's no way I'm going to be able to action this on my own. Oh, dude, I know. If, I don't know if you know this or not but I think Barnes & Noble's or Amazon.com commissioned a study that just said that uh, the, the determination was that 90% of people that buy books never read past the first chapter. So even with that information and arming them, if there's no form of accountability, I can see why. That's a crazy statistic. That blows my mind. I think I, I like religiously finish every book that I read. Oh, like, really? I'm, like, I'm looking I've like at my not, shelf I've, right now. I've not finished like, oh man, I've probably not finished 10 books. You never I've bought read, a book thinking it was amazing and then read the first two chapters and you're like, oh, this is awful. No, I don't think so. Like I'll at least skim to the end. You will, okay. I just have that much faith in authors. But, well, look. I wouldn't say ebooks or anything like that will be the same. But if if like a big five publishing company has published a book, like I'm like, come on, Penguin, like give me the good stuff. You yeah, know what where I mean? is I'm it? gonna keep reading. Okay, yeah. before we get too um, too far away, a couple things that kind of came up as we were talking a minute ago. Um, I hope your audience appreciate how relentless you are about getting me back to the point. It's awesome, you're a champion. <laughs> well, I'm the same as you, so I have to. I took some notes so that I wouldn't forget these. I think these are valid. Have you implemented any kind of refer a friend? 
um, techniques into your coaches line it questioning is, in their calls it is on the list to do but that's a really great idea that we uh we have already had but that's a really awesome idea so we we got to figure out the best way to make that happen so that the technology that drives it is bulletproof and then we will totally do that yeah yeah so um i i've all my whole life been into kind of like personal growth and self-development my mom exposed me to a young age in fact i met tony robbins 26 years ago when he was first getting started I had a summer camp that my mom sent me to where his kids were. But anyway, I recently just attended a pretty cool seminar up in, uh, a friend of mine is the CEO of a, uh, the, the country's longest uh, running seminar company. And they happen to be in the personal growth space. It's not landmark and it's not very cultish. It's actually very cool. But at the very end, they did that. They said, you know, can you on this piece of paper write down five people that you think would benefit from this, mm-hmm. this type of thing? And, uh, and then they asked you to bring them back a couple days after the seminar was over to this thing they call the ceremony or graduation. And, um, and then at that point they would make the offer to the five people. So I don't know how you can kind of incorporate that, but I know that pretty much is how they run their business, how they grow their business. They don't do any yeah. paid marketing, anything. It's just tell a friend kind of thing. Yeah. I think that the internet offers up a lot more elegant ways of doing that because like that does seem, I think a lot of people would be uncomfortable. I'd be uncomfortable. Like if you, if you put on a cool seminar and like we're buddies and if you were like, Pete did that, was this awesome? Like totally go and round up five people and bring them back to the graduation ceremony. Like I would be a little bit weird about that. You, you and I both, I, you and I both. And, um, but the, the way they the, framed it was, you know, you want people in your life that can be supportive of you and that understand yeah. where you are now. Yeah. And, and I get it. It's all, you know, whatever, but uh, and it worked, but I think, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of Cutco, the knife company. Mm-hmm. Um, they've got a, do you know Liz D'Alto? Yes. You can ask Liz. She was like a number one Cutco salesperson for a long time. But they've got this script that once you sell a knife, uh, they sell knives. They go to people's homes and sell knives. Once right. you sell a knife, you actually like, slide a piece of paper across the table and ask them to write down five people that would would benefit having better knives or something oh dude there's no doubt it's killer when i was my first business was a private therapy practice back in auckland new zealand like brick and mortar i worked out of a little office like it was i saw people for like all kinds of clinical nasty problems not entrepreneurs these were civilians you know yeah and i that's how i built my business is that i would actually i took it a step further with a technique like a a sort of a pre-framing technique where when they came in to have their first session with me I would basically work with them and identify like, okay, well, here's the goal. Here's where we want to get you. You know, like they have a a flying phobia. So if you're totally confident and you get on an airplane, like, will you consider that a massive success? And they say, absolutely. And at that point, I would say, cool. If we're able to get, get you to that point, only if, would you be comfortable? Like, would it be fair enough if I asked you who you know who you think would also benefit from these services? Only I love if. it. And they, they be, all said, sure, fair. I'm sure. And this is in their first session. And then I'd say like, but I'm not asking you now. I'm only going to ask you that if I when totally we get you the results. Mind. Yeah. Totally blow your mind. And so, and then the other thing that I would say to them is like, as we're going through like our, our work together, there's probably going to be things I say or things you think of that will even make you think of certain people. So just like hold on to all of those names, like, you know, whatever you think is relevant. And at the end, I'll ask you about them and we can, we can totally chat about it then. And so that would set people up so that at the end they'd be like, oh yeah, like in our second session you said something about like anxiety and I totally thought my brother-in-law struggles with that. So I told him about it and he wants to, you know, it just, it was a great technique. Dude, I would imagine, especially from that corporate uh, rush of clients or the big partnerships you're, you're doing, uh, implementing that ASAP could only help and bring more. The other thing I was going to say, when we talked about B2B and B2C and how B2B has such highs and lows, um, B2C kind of has the same depending on how you're doing marketing. And I wasn't sure if you're doing, you know, right now you're getting a lot of organic stuff, but I see this problem a lot with entrepreneurs who have good businesses where they're paying for traffic or paying for eyeballs and generating revenue from whatever money they spend, generating profit from that. Uh, generally what I see is though they find one thing that works and mm-hmm. they throw all their eggs in that basket Just hammer and, it, yeah. and then something happens. And you know, for example, I know a lot of guys that do really well with Google search. In fact, Jill and Josh Stanton were on another interview we did. Um, he's from Australia, not New Zealand, but, uh, they got hammered. They have a, a business that, uh, it's important for them to rank very high in Google for certain things. Oh dude, I hang out with like, I'm good friends with a few like affiliate guys who are just these, tr- these like SEO ninjas who are doing all kinds of esoteric stuff. Normal humans can't even understand. And Google put out an update and they're like, 
dude, my business model has been destroyed, you know? Like, yeah. and it's literally happening overnight. And I and honestly, I think that this is, like, a trend. And in another five years, like, these SE, those, like, hardcore SEO kind of slightly black hat-ish people will no longer be around. Like, I don't. Because Google are just getting too good. Like, they're, you know, they're making sure that if you're doing anything slightly skeezy to kind of scam the results. I'm not saying that people who are rocking amazing content and building like search engine kind of relevance that way are going anywhere. They'll probably continue to they'll be, be awesome. They'll probably be fine in the cloud. No, I get it. But my, yeah. my whole point with kind of bringing that up is that I see a lot of people just get stuck with one, one way of marketing or putting all their eggs in one basket. And yeah. uh, I think it's fascinating to kind of like, especially for people listening, you know, if you're going to, if you have your own business and, and, or you're getting ready to start one and you find one source that works instead of just, continually trying to expand, of course expand that to as big as you can uh, so for example if you're targeting people spending 50 bucks a day and you figure out you can scale it to 5,000 bucks a day and the profits remain the same or similar of course do that but take immediately start looking for other traffic sources and totally. ways to get people to attention I, I use this analogy of kind of like a wheel and each spoke in the wheel is a different source driving eyeballs to your to your offer yeah, or yeah. sales. And it's I mean, good. that's the whole reason why we decided to start working really hard on the B2C. I'll admit that we got complacent because we were getting some fat B2B deals like, you know, sort of six months ago and we totally did. We got complacent and uh, yeah, and that's why we've decided to branch out. And then B2C is like a whole other source. We've, we're actually branching out both of those channels into various different like subcategories because there's, there's different types of B2B work that we can do, different verticals that we can work in and yeah, B2C, like what we're focusing on right now, and this is, I mean, my my big tip for anyone who's like playing at home is trying to, we're trying to build like a bulletproof funnel before we start throwing things like paid traffic and all that kind of stuff at it. Because putting, in my experience, like bringing leads into the front end of a funnel is generally like a pretty, e is kind of the easy part. The hard part is like making sure that it's converting really, really well. And and just so anybody um, listening who maybe may or not know about funnels and all that stuff, what do you, basically Peter's saying is that you maybe have an advertisement somewhere on the web that drives people to a page where they're taking some form of action, either buying a product or they're uh, putting their name and email in to get access to a free report on how to kill procrastination or whatever. And then when you say you have the funnel, you've got follow up emails and if they make a purchase, then there's additional offerings that they can get. And once they make a purchase, they may be going to another awful offer where they can get you know more and more things in, um, the re I mean, I get that and in the funnel. We, we actually, with my business, we have the same thing. We've, we've relied heavily um, on search and affiliate traffic and I've never did any of the paid stuff. And I just was looking at my wheel of my business and I realized that these seven spokes, I should probably double these seven spokes because if any of these were to break, it would be a dent. And uh, right. so we immediately started looking at different things like, you know, running ads here, running ads there, running ads there. Uh, you know, banner ads on websites, uh, retargeting, uh, retargeting pixels, more upsells, more emails in the, in the campaigns when somebody buys a product for us, you know, giving them value, but then also offering additional products that may or may not be of interest to them. Um, anyway, so yeah, I mean, and it's not like it's some, you guys are ninjas, you guys, are, you guys are badass. I love <laughs> I, it. I deal with procrastination. A lot of what I just talked about has not actually happened yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I know I know this really great accountability coaching service that will totally solve that problem. So. I know, and I actually signed up, and I've yet I'm I'm such a procrastinator. I've yet to fill out the thing and go through it. I got to do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna commit oh, the yeah. debt. You asshole! I forgot that. Hey, Sean's listeners, this guy, this guy. I signed up, up and, like, and then never. No no, 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 you signed up for free. You were like, "Yo, dude, give me one of those memberships," and I was like, "All right." You, you know, I was, I was totally, I was, and dude, I'm not giving you a free ebook. I'm putting one, I'm paying one of my stuff. I didn't ask for that. I never would. I was going to pay for it. And then you volunteered it. I just said, I wanted to test it because I want to work with you in some fashion, whether we white label it or promote it to our audience. I can see a lot of value in it. And I wanted to go through it and you agreed. You're like, here, I'm going to give it to you. And I'm like, well, don't tell your people it's me. So there's, they treat me the same. I want it to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did all of that, and you've been procrastinating for so long that I actually completely forgot about that until right now. Because otherwise, I would have yelled at you. I know. I got to do it. I gotta, <laughs> I'll commit. How about this? I'll commit to by this time next Friday to be signed up and rock and rolling. Do it, man. I'm gonna we write that down. You, and we will blow your mind. Okay. So, all right, man. So I'm pretty excited about um, everything we've learned. Basically, you got this idea many, many years ago. You formulated it. Last January, you started investing in some software and building out the program. By June, you launch. Um, you have some realizations where B2B becomes a big player into your business. And then you have some more realizations that 
B2C needs to be a focus for some continual, gradual growth so you don't have big ups and downs. Mm. And um, Dude, running my, my entrepreneurial career is like a full-time education. I just have you saying like I have some realizations. I've been having realizations every single day since we started this. Oh, God, this you piece. and me both, yeah. Dude, that, yeah. that's what it's all about. But it is. Yeah, it's, that's the fun part. You know, it's like you're learning and you're growing and, and uh, you know, hopefully improving. And my question for you, a couple questions. Where do you see this business uh, from a growth standpoint a year from now? And, and let me just, it's safe to say you're doing six figures in revenue now. Totally. And with this particular business, not your other one, uh, but with this business, you have complete freedom. So if you want to work on something on Friday at 2 p.m., you can. And if Friday at 11, someone says, hey, let's go to the, um, some cool place and go get in a pool in New York City and it's hot, you're like, okay, I can do that. And then you can do the work later. You, is that fair to say you have freedom in that regard? Yeah, I'm, yeah, totally. I'm super addicted to that kind of freedom. I built the Shrink for Entrepreneurs to give me that. Like I've been location independent for the last three or four years just doing whatever the hell I want. I do about 15 consulting hours a week. It pays for an incredible lifestyle. That's kind of how I roll. So I, when I created this, I didn't want it to kind of impinge on that in any way. But at the same time, what we've created is so awesome and our dream is so big that I actually am working pretty hard on it right now because I want to. Like I'm, I'm we're yeah. having a blast, man. It's super fun. We're crushing. So yeah, well, you know, it's you're in that stage where it's like incredibly exciting and fun, and you're going to go from a few hundred customers to a few thousand, I'm sure, probably within a year would be my guess. And um, I don't know. I think it's cool. You have tremendous impact on the world, and you're making a big difference in the world by helping people kind of realize their goals and dreams and smash through those barriers and, and really equip them with the tools uh, they need so that on their own at a later date they can do it without having it. So it's kind of just changing habits. So I, I love everything about it. Um, it's pretty cool. In fact, a couple of questions that I always ask my guests. Um, question number one, are you, um, or do you have any, aside from Seth Bowden, Godin's book that we've already endorsed, do you have any great business books that you would recommend to somebody who is just getting started in business or who is in business or just anything that you think is impactful? Mm. I really dig, I really do dig permission marketing. Um, I, it's a lot different to a lot of Seth Godin's books because it, it's really old. He like predicted email marketing before it even happened. It's kind oh, of mind blowing. marketing? Yeah. Yeah. It's really old. It's like, it must be like 15 years old now. And it's like, it totally is like, here's what's going to happen with the internet. Email is going to be captured. It's all about building a permission asset, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, when you're reading this, it's all totally correct advice right now. But you're like, this dude wrote this and like, Oh, dude, I don't even know when. It's like it's super old. It's he. That to me is like that's what it, that was the first Seth Godin book I ever read, and it just blew my mind, melted my brain. Okay, and that's called Permission Marketing. Yeah, so that's that's one that's like super old. What has been? What have I been reading? that has been blowing minds right now. Have you read um, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell? Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of Gladwell. Yeah, actually. a lot of people aren't. I love him, but uh, that's so I funny. Get... And I love Seth Godin. You don't. That's so yeah. weird. Yeah, um, but like he's really smart. I can't say that I'm not a fan. His ideas are amazing. I find his writing pedantic. Like I really struggle to read his stuff. That's so funny. It's the opposite for me. That's so crazy, dude. Yeah, we, we must be like psychologically like opposite. We're and, wired different. Yeah. Yeah, it's so weird because I find his I I don't know like he just explains like his books. So like here is one idea that I could summarize in 500 words. Now I'm gonna write like. 26,000 words about it and I'm yeah. just like holy shit I get it dude like outliers yeah people are yeah I got it you know <laughs> yeah he beats it into your head through all these different stories and examples yeah, yeah. alright what, what is some other one give me one other one. Oh, I need to look at my uh, you know what I'm reading right now let me look at my bookshelf why don't you look on your bookshelf Peter and if you're I'm uh you know what I think is really great I Tell really me. I really dig personal development wise. I'm really into philosophy. So I, I am a big reader of uh, meditations, Marcus Aurelius. I think it's awesome stuff for entrepreneurs to be reading. I try and turn all of my personal one on one clients onto, uh, onto like Greek philosophy. It's some heavy stuff, but like this is when you read this, you're like, this guy's the original badass. This is the Who dude. Who is it? Marcus Aurelius. Uh, yeah, Marcus Aurelius. Yeah. Marcus, M A R C U S. What's his last name? Oh, dude. You have Actually, to make tell me the name of the book. Meditations. It's like an ancient. It's this just called meditation. Like Roman, this was a Roman. This dude was a Roman emperor. And it's it all about meditation. 
No, it's not about meditation. It is his meditations on philosophy and life. He was like a stoic philosopher. So I, who else is into this? I think Tim Ferriss is like being responsible for a bit of a rebirth of stoic philosophy amongst entrepreneurs. He's totally up with that stuff. But this is like, it's like a Bible to a bunch of high level entrepreneurs that I know. Is it really? It's, yeah, dude. And it's, it's called the, Meditation. Yeah, definitely read the introduction because this is not like a business book. Like to, to compare like Seth Godin and then meditations in the same kind of conversation is kind of weird you know like it's a very different book but i want to give you a wild card this is not what people on this podcast normally talk about but yeah like this dude was a roman emperor he was big into stoic philosophy he was big into thinking about his purpose the the point of like why he's on earth and what he's supposed to be doing with his time and the lessons are like more relevant now than they've ever been when you read this stuff you're like wow i should live my life like this that'll make me happy that'll make me successful like, yeah, it, it's super. Dude, it sounds super really important good, stuff. and I, I haven't read it, so I'm going to pick that one up. And um, I feel, you know, for people who are reading, who have read this book, who are listening to this right now, they're going to know what a ha- like a terrible job I'm doing at, introdu- at introducing it. Like this is <laughs> like this is like the book. Words can't explain. It's such a big deal. So yeah, you should totally check that out. So you're too good. And, and if anybody's listening, um, two things. I'll list these books over at themoneypillow.com, and it's Meditation by Marcus O'Reilly. Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Aurelius, Meditations. And then the other one is Permission Marketing by Seth Godin. And this actually... It's literally the opposite ends of a spectrum that probably shouldn't even exist. Like Those, those two the, books? Yeah, like they're so different. But oh, that's whatever. great. So those, yeah. those books, um, this show is actually sponsored by Audible.com. And I believe Audible has all of Seth Godin's books. I'm not sure about Meditations, but... If you want either of those books, you can go get them free. There's a link on my site. If you're listening to this, there'll be an interview there. You can click and uh, we'll give you a promo code that you can get those free. So thank you, audible.com, for that. And um, awesome. Okay, so this last question, any advice? I don't know if you can hear my kids, but they just got home from school. I can totally hear them. Uh, <laughs> it's so funny. All right, so any advice? Everybody, you, that was uh, that was Sean doing work life balance just there. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. I have a home office. It's where I have this kind of studio set up with this really nice mic and this. I don't know, you can't see because I can't turn the iMac. That way, we got this giant soundboard. A friend of mine who used to be a radio DJ gave me all this equipment, and I just don't feel like moving into my office, so I always come home to do these interviews. But um, my question for you is. It's obvious you're successful at what you do. You've got total freedom, total independent. Any advice you give to somebody, and let's, I just want to change this up a little bit. Any advice you give to somebody who's actually working a job and looking to break out of that and start their own business and, and run with that idea? Yeah, a couple of different things. I, I really don't like being the guy who's like, you just need to quit your job and commit to it and, and, and goddamn do it. I think that jobs are awesome and I think that if you're working a job and you're hesitating for like financial reasons, you know, obviously to pull the trigger on your idea and get started, I would focus on finding whatever opportunity you can at that jo- at that job to learn the stuff that's going to help make you a better entrepreneur. Because there's so much stuff that you can like like I think that people forget that. There's so much kind of entrepreneurial like almost hatred towards like the regular nine to fivers and like the corporate people but but don't forget that like these are businesses they're the same thing that they're just bigger versions of what you're trying to create when you go and start your own thing absolutely there's no difference yeah yeah so like well there is a difference but you get it yeah yeah what i always see is you know i think what we like everybody always sees is these people who start want to start businesses but they're you know they don't really have like the sales background the marketing background the leadership background like there's all of these skills that school doesn't prepare you for it never will like your parents probably don't prepare you for unless like in your case your parents are badass entrepreneurs but that's very few people you know so nothing in life is really preparing you for this but actually you can be paid to learn how to sell like I, I have people write in to me. I get a lot of like sort of random email from people over at petersheller.com kind of asking the shrink for entrepreneurs for tips. I have these people write in. They're like, I'm like basically on the street trying to make my little like XYZ business, whatever, work. I have no money left. I, what the hell do I do? And I'm like, go get a job. Go work. Like if nothing else, go work in a telesales center and learn how to sell like to anyone over the phone. Become a ninja at selling people over the phone. The stuff you will learn about psychology about how like value works, about how to be persuasive, 
is going to be invaluable when you're trying to hustle and build your business, no matter what it is. You can't build a business without that skill set. You know, and, and like even if you're trying to build this whole notion of like outsourcing, you know, a lot of people talk about outsourcing your weaknesses. That's totally true. If you're not good at accounting, you need to find a really good book, bookkeeper, accountant, blah, blah, blah. It's the only thing that that's not true for is sales. Like doesn't <laughs> oh, yeah. matter how big of a company you get. If you're running a big company with a big sales force and you're the CEO of that company, you have to show those people who are your salespeople that you can get in the trenches and do what they do better than they can as well to be able to lead them. Otherwise, I, they're not, they're not going to have any respect for you. Either that or hire somebody who believes in the mission and does really well, right? What do you mean? <laughs> so, <clears throat> I may not be the best salesperson on the phone, but I need people to do that for me. And I can no, find dude, you know how to sell. Like, you know yeah. how to sell. I know you. You know how to sell shit. <laughs> I, I just try and provide a lot of value and then make it so irresistible with the offer. That, right. Uh, and you do that online, right? Like yeah. you guys, you got, you'll write copy, you'll do webinars, you'll do all that type of stuff. So that's totally a skill. Like that's sales. You know yeah. how to do it. You may yeah. not know how to like hustle on, on the phone, but I'm just saying like. The, no, the no, no, no. I get it. But to go back to your, to go back to your, your, um, your point with, you know, learning all you can prior to quitting your job, things that'll help you as you move forward. It's fun. I mean, I went through that exact same thing. Yeah, because that's what business is. Like, as soon as you quit your job, you're just going to start like a full time learning curve. That's what being an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur is. You're just going to get spanked by the universe until you learn enough that you can start winning some. Like, that is what happens. It's so start the learning now. You know. Yeah, take advantage of it. We can in my real estate business. I did all the marketing for us, mm-hmm. and um, I knew I wanted to do something more online based. So I was like, okay, I want to focus on online marketing. And let's see if I can make this work for my real estate company. And in the process, it did. It worked tremendously. And I learned all these things that at the moment I said, okay, you know, I'm done with this business and and moved on. I was able to take those skills and apply them. So I can't agree with your advice anymore. I love it. And I I, just so you know, we had Robert Greene. Are you familiar with Robert Greene, the author? Uh, 48 Laws of Power, Mastery, 50th Law. Yeah, Uh, yeah. Had him on a webinar and he said the exact same thing. He's the exact same thing. And there, there are two schools of thought in that regard. Quit your job, put your back up against the wall, and make it happen. Because at that point, you're going to be extremely motivated and has a higher chance of success, but whatever. But my, in my opinion, I would never give anybody that advice because there's a high probability of failure we're starting any new business, no matter what it is. I forget the Nine, numbers. It's like 95% or some crazy Fail within like a few that. years, yeah. So that's and horrible. Dude, the, but the thing is, is that there's one outcome that starting a business will guarantee you. Well, like there's actually two outcomes. Profit gray hair. Or, profit or gray hair. Profit, yeah, yeah, right. Divorce. Like profit <laughs> or learning experiences. Oh, for sure. You're going to get one or the other. And so that's totally cool. And like what I encourage people to do who are in that should I quit place is basically set yourself up financially and like whatever you can do to prepare yourself for potentially like one to two years of just learning. And if you make it through that time, like you're going to get to the profit. You might accelerate. Like I know people who built businesses within six months, they were making profit. They were kicking ass. Maybe even less. Like it's. We've interviewed. I've interviewed some for the podcast. Right, but I like just to be safe. Like prepare yourself for about a year of just learning a whole bunch of stuff and not getting paid for it. You know I what agree. I mean? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And and the thing is, like, what creates success in business is just sticking at it. You know, like every single massively successful entrepreneur. I've worked with people with net worth. Like some of my clients have a net worth of hundreds of millions of dollars. People I work with one on one. These dudes have all had massive, massive failures. Like this is they they've had huge, huge failures in their life. They didn't. None of these. None of those people built businesses that were like successful right out of the door. It's interesting. You know what? And I want to end on this because I think it would be good to get your kind of feedback based on your knowledge level and your uh, and what you do. Because um, I he- and this is just totally off the cuff and just came up as you as you said this. I hear that all the time. Like, and I see these quotes about you know you have to fail in order to succeed. And everybody thinks it won't be them. Well, he- here's the thing, and I may be setting myself up for for failure by bringing this up by jinxing myself, but. In my professional career, I've, for the most part, gone from win to win to win. Probably one, two, three different industries, four different industries in the course of 15 years and been f- successful. My path has been like this, totally different things that I've been doing. And I've always thought that um, 
if you're smart and you're calculated and you make good decisions and you're logical and you have the ability to hustle when you need to hustle, um, that f- you don't necessarily have to fail. And I feel, this is my personal thing, I feel like those quotes are just there to encourage people who have failed. Because <laughs> I know a lot of people like me, they really haven't had many failures. And I'm sure at some point, I mean, I was asked this question, well, what's has- your biggest failure? And I was like, crap, maybe this website yeah. that we spent a few hours on and invested four grand into and it didn't work out. But that wasn't like a failure, really. You know what I mean? It, it was part of a business that we were just trying a new, new avenue. But <clears throat> let, yeah, let, let me let me try and unpack this a little bit. I think that what's going on, like we're talking about the same thing. We're about to be in like violent agreement with one another. Okay. Um, good. I think that and I just sounded extremely egotistical. It's not the way I meant for that to come out. By the way, I just meant yeah. That, no, no, dude, you're cool. You're a badass. I get it. Totally. I know that's, what, that's not what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I get it. Um, the thing is, is that that like that famous quote that's being quoted by hundreds of business gurus. You say that Einstein. Yeah, I don't know. Like everybody says, like basically, like there's no, you know, like, it, like everybody fails, fail hard, fail fast, all that type of stuff. Yeah. All that whole body of knowledge, what it really comes down to is an attempt by these people to reframe failure as feedback. And that's what I try and tell my Got clients it. is that there is no such thing as failure. It's all just feedback. And so what I'm trying to, like when I give this counterintuitive advice of like try and learn stuff from your current day job if that's where you're at. Because what I'm trying to do is basically set people up so that they can start a business as an experiment and get a shitload of feedback, learn from it, and then make money. You know what I mean? Which you yeah. can't tell me you didn't do, right? Like do you, you have, like you have learned stuff before you became, like, at, on the path of becoming successful. Oh, you know well, what yeah. I mean? I mean that that learning process is what right uh, aided the success. But there wasn't like honestly like. Little, I mean, I can't think of like failures per se. You know, little things. Yeah, you try like this. The thing is, the try thing this is, marketing is, technique. It doesn't work. Yeah. You try that. It doesn't work. You know, but nothing like, oh, I invested. And I'm actually in the middle of what could be my first failure in this iPhone app that I'm working on. Um, I really think it's going to be tens of millions to hundreds of millions of dollar company. I think we talked about it one time. Yeah, so totally. We did. Yeah. yeah and, but I've invested a lot of money into it and a lot of time. And it could fail. I'm not naive enough to think that it couldn't fail. And, to be honest, I don't really care because the process of building it. But that's is- the thing. That's the thing. That's why you are a badass is because like you don't even care. Like let's talk about your $4,000 website. Like you invested $4,000 into this website and like, oh, it didn't work. Like whatever you learned. And that's shareaquote.com. If you want to look at it, we thought we everybody was quoting on social media. So we thought we'll just make this site where they can go and all the, the most shared quotes will show up at the top and they can just click a button and send it to wherever. And yeah. And then the so guy that, some, the guy that yeah. we hired to build the site built it in a way that search engines didn't pick it up and boom, it gets that's 15 cool. visits a day still to this day. <laughs> Yeah. So, what but, did you learn about? Like, what did you learn about that? Right. Like, uh, the, hire a it's, guy who knows how to build so that search engines see the keywords. Yeah, I should have hired the seven thousand dollar guy instead of the three thousand dollar guy. Dude, that's the thing. Like, that's mm-hmm. a learning experience. Yeah, yeah. Thing, and it was fine. Yeah, but it wasn't like oh the, god, other, you know, like I, my wife's other wanna gonna, be other wanna be entrepreneurs. Like other like no, sorry, you're not a wanna be entrepreneur. Wanna be entrepreneurs. Like people who are, people who are just starting out. I love them. But the problem is, is that we we are like conditioned to think about building a business the same way we think about taking a test in school. I get it. And the it, thing yeah. is, in, like where you fail, like you pass or you fail. The thing is, is that that building that website was an epic fail. There's people probably listening to this for whom like throwing four thousand dollars at a project and having it just evaporate, like turn into nothing, would be an epic fail. But you were in a place where like you're you're mentally treating all of these things as projects that you try stuff out, you learn, you hustle. And then you make it successful. That is what I'm talking about. That's that ability to stick with it. That yeah, is so oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, you know, so, you think about it, like the iPhone app uh, that I've been working on probably got about 25 times as much as the website that built into it. And if it fails, I mean, I, I'm, I'm planning as if it's going to be a success. I'm running at it full speed. But I, I'm not naive enough to think that, you know, some of my ideas just don't work out and it may not work out. And that's fine. But I, I, I look back, Peter, at the last two years since the moment I kind of came up with this concept and been thinking about thinking about it, it's provided me a tremendous amount of excitement in my life that, right? you know what I mean? Like that almost is worth the investment within itself because I've had this thing I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to. You can't take that away. You right. can't take that away and it's allowed me to be like almost a lot of times on, often on a daily basis, I'll get in a conversation, somebody will say, tell me about it. I'll tell them all about it. Next thing you know, we're both like geeking out, excited and it's, I don't know. So there's so much to gain from it. That I'll know, have a ton of understanding about iPhone apps and that side of the business working with 
uh, contractors, uh, sorry, working with, um, you know, getting incorporated, selling shares of your company to investors. And uh, I got incorporated with this one in Delaware, which was a new experience for me and all this stuff. So anyway, it's all kinds of cool learning stuff that's gone on that I will take with me no matter what I do. Um, that'll it'll benefit me and I'll value from it. And it could, this would be the closest thing to my favorite. I don't, I wouldn't even view it as a failure in that regard because I've gotten so much value out of it. So it just goes back to what you're saying about it's feedback and it's a learning yeah, process. You, you, yeah, you uh, psychologically, you're reframing this in your mind right now. And that's what I'm trying to get like every entrepreneur to, go, to do. And I think like what's so cool about the internet uh, is that it gives people the opportunity. Like now it's possible for people to start businesses in their spare time, which is really cool because you can be working a job, paying all of your bills. And so that you have the mental space in your life to like, build, like start your website and start trying to sell your thing or doing whatever you want to do online. So you can experiment, you can get feedback. You don't need to actually even risk failure because like what happens if you fail? Like you just start all over again, you you know? Yeah, like, that's what you do. you this, dude. It's unbelievable. Um, over here, over here. Oh, no, that's not it. <laughs> I filed it somewhere, but yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable. My attorney said, if you want to do a Delaware Corp, um, it'll be a couple grand, we'll do this and this. He's like, but honestly, you can go online and you can spend a couple hundred bucks and make it happen. And once you do that, then bring that paperwork to me and I'll work with you with share distribution to your investors and all this stuff. Yeah, the like barrier to, the barriers to entry have all gotten so low. So I went no to a website called, I think it was like incorporate.com. Here's my stamp. So like if I stamp any documents, like stock symbols being signed over. Um, I had the freaking paperwork right here a couple days ago, but I spent 200 bucks, 15 minutes and Three days later, I got this FedEx package to me with all my corporate documents um, showing that it had been filed, approved, um, my corporate seal stamp, my shares, my stock shares, my all the, um, well, just everything you could, you know, you need. And normally I would have paid a couple grand, had a meeting with an attorney for an hour or two, gone over this and that. And it just blows me away. Like we live in a day and age that starting a business has never been easier. And yeah. And, and then the, and if you think about it from an information perspective, uh, there is so much information that if I want to know how to build an iPhone app, I can go to Google, type in how to build an iPhone app, and probably with a little bit of time invested, figure that process out and do it. If I want to start, start a company, you know, making crystal, whatever this thing is, I could probably go to Google and figure it out. Uh, right. So if you just have a little bit of ambition and hustle, and that's, you know, <clears throat> it's been one of the best things about doing this podcast is I'm getting emails, Facebook messages, tweets. Um, when people sign up for my email list, I have an email that says, go ahead and hit reply. I read every email that comes and, and I try and reply to all of them as well. And I get, so I get a lot of them and people are just like, you know, you've inspired me. I have never thought outside of the nine to five, uh, mentality. And for the first time in my life, I'm seeing what benefit I could have and how it could change my life and, and why I want that. And you know, you'll, you'll understand this as a psychologist and maybe agree with me, maybe not. But if you look around everything in your room that I can see right now on your screen and everything in my room was once somebody's thought. And prior to it coming into existence, it had to be thought. And I think what stops most people from building a business, especially one that's passive, is they just don't think it's possible. And right. so through, the, through all of these interviews in the podcast, and when the book comes out, this is gonna be, it's gonna be really structured from start to finish. But um, my idea is to, or the, the idea of this, the whole money pillow thing is to expose people to other people's stories so that they have an understanding of how they went from just like me to successful and all those steps in because I think once you understand something then at that point you can adopt a belief that it is possible and then once you believe it's possible only then at that point can you attain it yeah and sense? I think totally I the the point that I was trying to make like what I'm ultimately trying to get at is that the very common advice that we should that people who are starting out should just like throw like just dive in a hundred percent commit to it and like give it all that they've got, quit their job, do all of that. It's just like so not necessary now. The bar barriers to entry have been removed. You can afford to like try this stuff out. It's way easier than you think it is to get started. And and that's really all I'm trying to say is that like, yeah, it, I'm just obsessed is. with answering that question is that it's just like, just focus on, on learning. Just can focus I, on learning a whole bunch of stuff. Can and I give you're you a going classic, to be successful. classic example? And then we'll we'll wrap this up because we're getting kind of long. I know people are probably sitting in their car outside their destination waiting for this to end. How but long has it been? How long have we been? We're gone for like an hour and thirty, I think. Holy crap! I know. I may have to edit this so that people still want to listen. Um, last summer or last fall, about a year ago, I built my my sister sent me a picture of the skateboard swing. 
It was a swing for kids made out of a skateboard. She said, you should build this. I grew up skateboarding and snowboarding, so she thought of me. I looked at it. I went online. I searched. I couldn't find anything. I found a few images. They were horrible. So I literally just went and bought a blank skateboard, built it, hung it in a tree. A week later, we had a birthday party. Uh, we had goats here. We had chickens. We had a whole petting zoo. We had a trampoline. We had a jumpy house. We had pony rides. We had you name it. And guess what all the kids wanted to do? The skateboard, play with that thing. the play yeah. with that thing. They were lined up. So the parents were asking me, Hey, could you make me one of those? You know, could you make me one of those? Like, I think I had two or three requests that day. And, You're like, damn, uh, this is a new business idea. <laughs> well, that's the thing. So, yeah. um, I went two Saturdays later, I bought the domain name SK eight swing.com skate swing.com. Mm-hmm. Um, bought a WordPress website that looked pretty damn close to how I'd want the website to look. I have a little bit of knowledge with WordPress. I'm awful literally awful, but I have a little bit of knowledge spent three hours on a Saturday morning while everybody was pretty much still sleeping or Saturday afternoon while they were gone. I can't remember, but nobody was rounding. I knocked it out in three hours, tied mm. a PayPal account to it. And then <clears throat> literally this is going to sound awful, but I went on Fiverr and I bought some SEO things. And I, I know a little bit about SEO, name your, upload your images, name them the right way, your content, do this and that, put it up. And that thing has earned probably six thousand dollars in sales in a year without me wait doing... what's the product are you selling the actual thing or... it's a swing yeah it's a swing so the first 20 I, we get an order we get we get like one a week two a week they just find us we get 12 organic searches from google a day people that find us 12 to 15 and i guess you can do That's the math ridiculous. on that Yes, there we, we go, it. people. It's that easy. Yeah, like yeah. it's that. I never went. If I went, if I went back and spent another three hours on the web page or paid somebody a thousand bucks to spend on that, I could probably double the conversions. Um, but literally, it was a three-hour job, and I take it back. Um, I did have to build twenty of those swings. Yeah. And then I'm just like, as they came in, I'm just like, oh god, we got to ship that one here. So then I did an interview for this podcast with Mike and Mike Teku who sell these, uh, Mike Teku and Mike Hansen, they sell these photo booths. They talked about finding a video game manufacturer to build their photo booths that they were selling. Yeah. And, and um, I was like, oh my God, I could run an ad on Craigslist and find a general laborer. I could spend an hour teaching him how to do this and do it. So that's what I did. So I bought 50 of these things. Yeah. Pretty much took all my profit. Uh, not really, but took a lot of the money and bought 50 of these things and had them build 50. And so now I've got in my garage 50 of them in a box. When an order comes in, my wife just grabs it and takes it down to UPS. And we get like a $70 profit margin on these things this is the thing this is like this is how easy it is but what you're describing is there's like in your narrative there's multiple points where you've had these realizations where you've had this learning and that's what people need to prepare themselves for like you're like oh wait i can hire a guy on craigslist like that's a massive insight you know like if this is if this was your first ever business that would have been a game-changing moment you're like a jaded cynical entrepreneur at this point so you were like oh yeah i totally should have thought of that you know yeah but like i should have because dude i can't tell you how many nights it's like 10 o'clock and there's so many other things i want to do so sitting in the garage and drilling through a seven ply maple canadian maple skateboard and running rope <laughs> through it and tying knots and yeah. right yeah but that like that's literally like what it is like that's what it comes down to is that building successful businesses is about the the entrepreneur like the guy the girl whoever's founding this thing basically learning all of the stuff and becoming the kind of person who makes incredible massive things happen and that's how, like, when you meet, I think when we meet these people who are, like, the gods of business and, you know, like, these super famous people, we kind of forget that, like, that's how they got there. They just learned a bunch of stuff. They have a real-world education of years of experience of exactly what you're talking about, trying something, figuring out a way to improve it. You didn't even fail. You just wanted to tweak it, make it better, you know? Like, just yeah. feedback, feedback, feedback. That's all it is. And we And you can start that any time doesn't matter if you have a job you don't need to quit you don't need to like you can just start that you can do it's so easy to do part-time and honestly if i had the energy to put a few hours a week into that business i could probably get it to a six-figure business you know it's a toy essentially and there's all these uh-huh. really cool crafty toy stores out there that like handmade toys my cost on them i sell them for 97 my cost is like 23 bucks i think 22 bucks and um you know, I could sell those easily for 50 bucks to a toy store to resell. And Oh dude, there's so many yeah. things you could do. You could optimize, like you, you could optimize your costs. You could probably like start driving for traffic. Half, yeah. Yeah. For <clears> half <throat> what you're doing them for, you could optimize your shipping, like, you know, so that it was all happening automatically. You could outsource the entire operation of the thing. You could build a skateboard swing empire. doesn't mean you have <laughs> to, but like, 
it, but that's the process. That's how this works. It yeah. is. It's so funny. I just got rope in the mail, some samples from China, because I can get rope in China for a, th- not a third, a tenth of what I pay here in the States. And it's funny. But anyway, it's just... Everybody it, listening to this, just know that you're listening. You're, you're like now like the listening to the future skateboard swing king, undisputed <laughs> emperor of the no. world. You heard it here first. Honestly, Peter, like <laughs> I am focused on big businesses and um, it's too much work for me for the cap on that. So, but it's a fun pro- Originally, my wife wanted a business, so I'm going to do this for her. I'm going to set her up. She was going to build the swing. I thought, oh, this is cool. She could build it into something good. And, and then she quickly decided she wanted nothing to do with it. So now, I've, instead of taking the site down, because it generates $500 a month in sales, which is about $100 a month in, in cost with that, I was like, well, that's stupid. It's got all these traffic coming to it. Let's just hire somebody to build it, and we'll get you know, a, a nice dinner out every week. Um, once it's done. And so that's literally how it works. Her only thing is just drive them out on the road and drop it off at UPS and done. This is so. my, this is my skateboard money. That's what you say when you throw it down. It's my on, surfboard yeah. money. I can buy a new surfboard a month without profit or almost. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. awesome, dude. I love it. All right, dude. So we've just wrapped for, for way too long. And if you've listened to this whole thing, if I haven't edited it down, I think we're at about an hour and a half now. I really appreciate you guys sticking on and listening to it. Peter, You've been I hope, amazing, we, I hope we threw enough like nuggets of kind of insight and cool stuff in there to make <laughs> listening to it worth it. Dude, I hope with, they made uh, the end. I feel on. like that last 20 minutes was pretty epic um, when we started with the advice bit and whatnot. So I hope we made it to the, people made it to the end. Um, all right, dude. So where can people reach out to you? You, you don't have like a big online presence, do you? You're on, you're on Twitter. That's, that's it. Yeah. Dude, do I have, I mean, internet marketing is what I do. So yeah, totally. I, uh, so they can reach out to me at petershallard.com. That's, that's my, that's my day job. That's the shrink for entrepreneurs HQ, Peter Shallard, S-H-A-L-L-A-R-D.com. And, um, yeah, they can get in touch with me there. We do a really cool thing. People can test drive my services as the shrink for entrepreneurs. Um, it's not for the faint of heart, though. It's a pretty cool process. Go and check it out. And then, of course, at Commit Action, you can actually go and sign up and jump on the uh, grab the four pillars of productivity as developed by me and our badass uh, advisor, Dr. Srini Pillai, who uh, is this incredible Harvard neuroscientist. Um, and we've really made a study of yeah what it takes to beat procrastination. We break it down for you by e- by email. It's totally free. You can get everything that you need to know at commitaction.com. Oh, that's awesome. And then you're on Twitter under Yeah, just my name at petershallard.com. Awesome. I mean, not dot com, just Peter Shell. What am I saying? It's late, man. It's fr- it's six. It's seven p.m. on a Friday after uh, Friday evening right now. I know, dude. I've, I don't I even know appreciate my Twitter you. handle anymore. I appreciate you being with me here this late on a Friday. I'm going to the beach no, dude. when we're done. I wouldn't miss it for the world. I'm going to go and do the New York City equivalent of the beach and go to the bar, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Um, so awesome, dude. I really, again, I appreciate it. And if you're listening to this, I'll have links to all of Peter's um, stuff on themoneypillow.com. And you can also watch this interview if you're listening to this uh, and you want to see. Yeah, hit me up. Come say hi on Twitter. I totally chat with everyone who talks to me. It'll be awesome. We'll, yeah, we'll, you are. We'll you're connect. accessible. So that is yeah. cool. So, all right, brother. Again, I really appreciate you. And um, with that, I guess we'll... Dude, I love it. I love chatting any anytime. All right, let's do it again tomorrow. All right, catch you later. <laughs> <laughs>